Hello, I'm D.C. Brown. I'm the minister for the Magnolia Church of Christ, located at 823 South Magnolia Boulevard, here in beautiful Magnolia, Texas. If this is your first time joining us, we want to say welcome. Glad that you are with us. You'll find that this is a lesson in a series of lessons, all of which are posted on our Facebook account. You can also find it at our website, magnoliachurchofchrist.com. But we also have, uh, in addition to this series, we have uh, special lessons for ladies. We have activities for children. We have some of our periods of worship time together. You can access all of it at any time by going either to our Facebook account for Magnolia Church of Christ or to our website at uh, www.magnoliachurchofchrist.com. And any time that's possible, we'd like for you to join worship with us. We have activities for all ages. Uh, and so we hope that you'll come and worship with us and uh, give us a chance to uh, get to know you and say to you, we're glad that you're with us in person. Our vision is to be a family of God that loves unconditionally, that is united in its service and wants to be a beacon to the community. Once again, I'm glad that you're here and welcome to Bible study time. Today's study is taken from the sixth chapter of 1 Samuel. So I hope you have your Bibles out, have them open to 1 Samuel chapter 6. Hope you have something to write with, a notepad to write on. Perhaps you need a cup of coffee or a glass of iced tea. But we're glad that you're joining with us, and we will get started in just a moment with a word of prayer. So if at this point you need to pause the recording to uh, go back and refresh your memory over things we've already looked at, or gather up some things so that your uh, Bible study time will be the most effective study time that you can make it, go ahead and pause the video, and we'll begin the prayer. When our Father in heaven, as we begin our study of this great text that you provided for us, we're thankful, Father, that you have indeed given us in your word those things that strengthen our faith, those things that that demonstrate to us that you are a holy God and a righteous God and that we can only approach you in humility uh, with an expectation of mercy and grace. We ask, Father, that you would bless our study, that you would give us insights, that our uh, time in your word will strengthen us, help us to be the people that you want us to be. Create within us the heart that you want us to have. Bless us in our time of study. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. The battle between the Israelites and the Philistines recorded in 1 Samuel chapter 4 ended with a, a tragedy of monumental proportions as far as Israel is concerned. Thousands upon thousands have lost their lives. The two sons of the high priest Eli had been killed on the same day in battle, just as the prophet had predicted. The greatest tragedy of all, of course, is that the Ark of the Covenant that was taken into battle foolishly and without consulting God it now lies in the hands of the enemy. Chapter 5 tells us that although the Philistines have captured the Ark of the Lord, or as they called it, the Ark of the God of Israel, it has not been a fortuitous decision for them. When they brought the ark from the battlefield into the lands of Philistia, they brought it to their great city of Ashdod. And there they placed the ark of the Lord in the temple of their chief god, whom they called Dagon. Now Dagon was a god of fertility and also a god of war. And they placed the ark of the covenant to the side of Dagon in his temple, but the Lord destroys their idol and then ravages the city of Ashdod and all of its territories with horrendous tumors. 
the hand of the Lord was so severe on the people of Ashdod, uh, they will insist that the ark be sent elsewhere. And so it was taken to the Philistine city of Gath. But there the Lord caused a great confusion to occur in Gath, and in its men, both young and old, tumors began to appear. And they smote the city so severely that the people of Gath demand that the ark of the Lord be removed. And so it's moved to a third Philistine city, this time to the city of Ekron. And once again, we're told that a deadly confusion occurs in Ekron, and more tumors break out. And the text says the hand of the Lord was very heavy there. The fifth chapter ends by telling us that the afflictions of God wrought on the Philistines was so great that the cry of those in Ekron ascended to heaven. And so in the sixth chapter, we're going to read about the Philistines' decision to send the Ark of the Covenant back home. It's not going to be an easy decision. It's going to be a somewhat drawn-out process. There's going to be a great deal of reverential respect and fear. And you might think that when the Ark of the Covenant gets back to Israel, that things will get back to normal. But that's not going to be the case either. Chapter 6, verse 1. Now the ark of the Lord had been in the country of the Philistines seven months. Seven months. That could seem like a really long time if you're dealing with the things that they're dealing with in these Philistine cities. It sort of boggles the mind really when you think about how long they endured that before they made the decision to send the ark back. Think about the circumstances that we're in. With this uh, coronavirus, we're not quite two months into uh, a stay-at-home semi-quarantine situation, and most of us are more than ready to see this thing come to an end. And we have, maybe somewhat grudgingly, but we have willingly gone along with all of the, the recommendations that the government has given because the quicker we can get this behind us, quicker we can get back to life as we want to live it, the happier we're going to be. It sort of boggles the mind to think about the fact that that uh, they know what's going on in these cities of Philistia. Chapter 5, verse 7. Chapter 5, verse 10. They're under no illusions as to the source of their miseries and all the death that has occurred. It's been, it's been epic. Uh, a tragedy on a scale that, that, that boggles the mind. Can you imagine today knowing that, that uh, the coronavirus causes illness and death and knowing that social interaction multiplies the, the, uh, the occurrences of, of sickness and death and then take no drastic measures to curtail social interaction? Why would you do that? Well, why would you knowingly submit yourself and, and, and your people for seven months of punishment the way that they have done in Philistia? I think it indicates a pride problem. When you look at uh, verse 6, as we'll get to in a few minutes, I, I think that will sort of explain to us why this seven-month period has been allowed to stand. It's a, a long time. All right, verse 2. And the Philistines called for the priest and the diviners, saying, What shall we do with the ark of the Lord? Tell us how we shall send it to its place. They said, If you send away the ark of the God of Israel, do not send it empty. But you shall surely return to him a guilt offering. Then you will be healed, and it will be known to you why his hand is not removed from you. I don't think that I would like to be in the position that these priests and diviners find themselves in. Their Philistine lords have finally made the decision to send the ark of, of the God of Israel back to Israel and have correctly perceived that their miseries and all this death that is occurring uh, is because God is offended by what they've done. So now the question is, how do we return it in such a way that God will relent? And you can 
you can almost feel sorry for the priests and diviners, and you can certainly see that they are hedging their bets, we might say, as they give their advice. It's, it's a very careful uh, path that they have to walk. They can't act as if they have no idea. They also can't give wrong advice. To indicate that they don't have an answer or to give advice that turns out to be wrong could be a real abrupt career ender. And I mean abrupt by way of being put to death. And so I think it's somewhat clear from the text that they're being uh, intentionally vague and, and uh, giving their answers. And they're going to give it in, in uh, a series uh, of stages. Um, they're definitely going to be taken out of their element here. If, if, if they're used to being able to, to be in control of the environment and the situation, you know, in a place where they can use smoke and mirrors and all those sort of things to impress, this is not the setting that they find themselves in now. And uh, the answers that they give really are, are life and death answers. And so uh, they're in a tough spot. Uh, they have all their professional careers, for lack of a better term, deal in, and they've dealt in, in pagan rituals. They've dealt with superstitions and superstitious people. They're used to having to, to give logical reasons for why gods didn't answer the questions uh, or the requests or the petitions that were put to them. And they always have to do it in such a way that it it puts the, the person at fault if the gods didn't answer that person's petition as they wanted it. But these are their lords. And they're going to have to be very careful about how they go about doing this. And so the strategy is going to be to First of all, determine an appropriate guilt sacrifice. Secondly, uh, present a method of returning the ark that will prove once and for all that God has been in control over this entire circumstance. Um, and, and yet the language of their replies, I think, uh, will give them the reason to say, I, I told you so, or... On the other hand, I didn't really think this was the hand of the God of Israel in the first place. Uh, they want to be able to answer their questions and come up with solutions in a way that will allow them to save face just as much as it would allow the, the Philistine lords to save face. So the first recommendation, the priests say you need to give something worthy of being a guilt offering. If all that has happened here are in fact the acts of God, then he's done these things to your people because you took from him his ark. Give a guilt offering commensurate with a crime if you think you've offended him. If he stops afflicting your people and you're healed, then you'll know that your guilt offering was accepted. You know, that's not really the answer that I would have been looking for if I had been one of these Philistine lords. I would like for them to have said, here's exactly what you do, and we'll give you a money-back guarantee. This will work. That's not quite what they get. They're going to have to, well, we might say roll the dice and, and trust that what they're being told to do will be beneficial. Verse 4. Then they said, What shall be the guilt offering which we shall return to him? And they said, Five golden tumors and five golden mice, according to the number of the lords of the Philistines, for one plague was on all of you and on your lords. So you shall make likenesses of your tumors and likenesses of your mice that ravage the land, and you shall give glory to the God of Israel. Perhaps he will ease his hand from you, your gods, and your land. You know, the answers that the lords are receiving from their own priests and diviners could not have been pleasant answers to have to listen to. First of all, they have been told that they must present guilt offerings, an acknowledgement that they have wronged, that have offended the God of the Israelites. And secondly, those guilt offerings themselves are tantamount to a confession that God is the source of their miseries, the source of the death and the pestilence. It is an admission that he is greater than they are, greater than their gods. 
The guilt offerings that they are to present are expensive. Five golden tumors that precisely represent the miseries that have been inflicted upon the men of these cities. And the five golden mice are expensive uh, guilt offerings that indicate that their, their fields have been devastated. Think about that. There's going to be little yield or, or maybe even no harvest at all this year in the, the fields of the Philistines. And that's an interesting thing to note because as we'll see as we get to the end of the chapter that when the ark makes its way back to Israel, it will come into Israel at the time of harvest. And while the Philistines have nothing to harvest, the Israelites will be busy reaping their own harvest. You know, the priests and the, and the diviners here of Philistia uh, find themselves having to prescribe guilt offerings to a God that they don't serve and having to instruct their own lords to give glory to the God of Israel. Uh, that's, that's a powerful admission of their understanding. That's why Paul says that the Gentiles are without excuse. You cannot contemplate what's happening in life and the things that you have and, and your, your existence without acknowledging that there is a greater force. And so these priests have been required uh, to give an answer, and the answer that they give uh, forces them and the Lord's to give glory to God. But notice also that the priests in their language have, have distanced themselves not only from the gods that they serve, um, but they've also distanced themselves from the, the guilt that is impugned upon the Lord's. This is what you need to do, and perhaps he will relent his hand from you. And, and so they sort of isolated themselves and, and took themselves out of the equation. And that's not just the, the language in which they speak, because a little later on, uh, we're going to see them reinsert themselves into uh, a hopeful remedy or solution uh, if the Lord's follow what they have told them. Verse 6, Why then do you harden your hearts as the Egyptians and Pharaoh hardened their hearts? When he'd severely dealt with them, did they not allow the people to go? And they did. So the things that God had done to the Egyptians was well known. And the knowledge of what God had done to the Egyptians long ago had been enough to create the despair that was expressed seven months ago when the Philistine camp realized that the ark of the God of Israel had been brought into the camp of the Israelite armies. Look back at chapter 4 and verse 8. And now the priests are building an argument based on that same knowledge. If the Philistine lords don't take their advice, then those lords will only continue to be uh, guilty of the same prideful folly that Pharaoh had been guilty of when he refused to let Israel go in spite of intensifying plagues. You know, they're really making some gutsy arguments here. You're guilty. You must present a guilt offering. You've hardened your hearts like Pharaoh, and you must stop. But notice that there is no we in their statements. You know, when Nehemiah makes his prayer to God, uh, Nehemiah confesses in our sin what we have done. These priests aren't willing to go that far. This is all on the heads of the Philistine lords. But now later when they want God to relent, they're hoping to share in the relief, just not in the burden. Verse 7, Now therefore, Take and prepare a new cart and two milch cows on which there's never been a yoke and hitch the cows to the cart and take their calves home away from them. Take the ark of the Lord and place it on the cart and put the articles of gold which you return to him as a guilt offering in a box by its side. Then send it away that it may go. Watch. If it goes up by the way of its own territory to Beth Shemesh, then he has done us this great evil. But if not then we will know that it was not his hand that struck us. It happened to us by chance. You know, the priest strategy is really a good strategy. Let's give credit where credit's due. This, this is really brilliant. 
not only have they come up with the solution and the lords have required of them a solution, but they have come up with a solution and a proposal that is a way to test the belief that the lords, the Philistine lords have, and that is that the God of the Israelites is actually the one responsible for all the calamity that's fallen upon these Philistines. Now bear in mind that the Philistines have Israel under control. They are subjugated to Philistine will. To the priest's way of thinking, is it, easy, is it even possible that those who are subjected to us would have a God so powerful that that God can afflict our people? Our Lord seemed to think that may be the case. Let's devise a test that will give us the answer one way or the other. You know, you, you know that the last thing that they want to admit is that the God that they don't serve, the God that they don't minister to, is greater than the gods that they do. And so at the end of the day, they've come up with a proposal that if the Lords follow it precisely to the letter, it's going to lead to only one of two possibilities. It will positively affirm that Jehovah God, the God of Israel, has done this to the Philistines, or it just happened and God had no part in it. And so they propose a circumstance that could only occur if there is a God who intervenes and intervenes in the natural order of things and makes things happen that otherwise would not have happened. Uh, <clears throat> if he's no powerful than the impotent gods that these priests serve, the two mother cows with nursing calves, and that's this archaic English word milch, that's what that means. It means a mother calf with a nursing calf. A mother it means a mother cow with a nursing calf. If um, the Jehovah God of Israel is no more powerful than the impotent gods of the Philistines, there's no way in the world that two mother cows with nursing calves who have never been trained to pull an ox cart with the oak before, there's no way that they're going to pull that cart away from where their calves are pinned and purposely go down a road without veering to the left or the right all the way to the Israelite lands and to the city of Beth Shemeth. It's a, it's a clever test. If the cows are not under the divine influence of God, they'll just act like cows. And they won't do what they're expected to do. They'll refuse to leave their young. They'll refuse to stay on the road. And that will prove once and for all that God has no control and not a God to be feared or, or, or reckoned with. On the other hand, <clears throat> if these cows do this unthinkable thing, this, this thing that goes against the instinct of any bovine mind, then God must indeed be powerful. And it also means that he must be clearly willing to accept their guilt offerings. And notice also the clever way in which the priests have built some credibility for themselves. If the plan works, they're the ones that came up with it. If, in fact, it doesn't work, then they still take no blame for what has happened over the past. Their language has been you. You must bring your guilt offering. You must do something uh, to appease this God so that you have control over your people, your land. It's all about you, your God, your land. But if it works and God relents, then their language says, we will know that it was not his hand that struck us. It happened to us by chance. That's what I call hedging your... Verse 10. Then the men did so and took two milch cows and hitched them to the cart and shut their calves up at home. They put the ark of the Lord on the cart and the box with the golden mice and the likenesses of their tumors. And the cows took the straight way in the direction of Beth Shemesh. They went along the highway, lowing as they went, and did not turn aside to the right or to the left. And the lords of the Philistines followed them to the border of Beth Shemesh. Wouldn't you like to have been there, to have been on the road as these Philistine lords are following behind these two cows? 
working together, pulling the ox cart. Wouldn't you like to have heard the conversations that surely must have been passing between them as, as they saw these two mother cows doing something that it's ever bit as unnatural as the time that Balaam's donkey rebuked the prophet for striking him when all he had done, in fact, was try to save Balaam's life. Numbers 22, verses 22 through 30. I, I think it would have been uh, a, a very instructive conversation to have overheard. Now the people of Beth Shemesh were reaping their wheat harvest in the valley, and they raised their eyes and saw the ark and were glad to see it. What a strange thing for the lords of the Philistines to observe. Because of the mice infestation in their own lands, there is going to be no harvest or very little of one. Uh, but now they see that the Israelites, whom they have been in control over, have the luxury of reaping their harvest. And the lords observe that, and, and they're going to learn from it, no doubt. And also, they observe the joy of the people of Beth Shemesh as they see the ark coming their way. You know, <laughs> the last Philistine city that the ark had come into, it didn't get the same reception. When the, the ark approached the city of Ekron in 1 Samuel chapter 5 and verse 10, it says, And as the ark of God came to Ekron, the Ekronites cried out, saying, They have brought the ark of God of Israel around to us to kill us and our people. One other thing, we need to know that Beth Shemesh is almost due east of Ekron, uh, and it was a city that belonged to the tribe of Judah, but it's located on the northern border between the, the, the border with uh, the tribe of Dan, Joshua chapter 15 and verse 10. And you also need to know that Beth Shemesh is one of the cities given to Judah that was then given to the Levites as one of their 48 cities. Joshua chapter 21 and verse 16. Verse 14. The cart came into the field of Joshua, the Beth Shemite, and stood there where there was a large stone. And they split the wood of the cart and offered the cows as a burnt offering to the Lord. The Levites took down the ark of the Lord and the box that was with it, in which were the articles of gold, and put them on the large stone, and the men of Beth Shemesh offered burnt offerings and sacrificed sacrifices that day to the Lord. When the five lords of the Philistines saw it, they returned to Ekron that day. You know, the five lords of the Philistines have witnessed and in fact they participated in this impossible act, this, this conduct of the two cows that defies all of nature. They've walked behind these, these uh, cows as they have gone unswervingly down the road straight into Beth Shemesh. They've observed them then come to an abrupt stop. And it just happens that they come to an abrupt stop at the very place where acceptable offerings and sacrifices can be made. There's no way for these Philistine lords to misinterpret what they've seen, to miss the point of what they've seen to go home and chalk it off as a strange coincidence, they know. They absolutely know that they have been dealt with by God because of taking the ark, but they also know that God has accepted the guilt offering when they returned the ark to him. They had to have gone home with a huge load off their shoulders. Verse 17 these are the golden tumors which the Philistines returned for a guilt offering to the Lord. One for Ashdod, one for Gaza, one for Ashkelon, one for Gath, one for Ekron. And the golden mice, according to the number of all the cities of the Philistines belonging to the five lords, both of fortified cities and of country villages. The large stone on which they set the ark of the Lord is a witness to this day in the field of Joshua the Beth Shemite. And so for the Philistines, um, this sad saga in, in their history ends on a positive note. They have done exactly as they have been instructed to do in offering up the, the, the tumors, the golden tumors and the golden mice. And notice that the people of Philistia have taken no chances. 
it seems that they've included a lot more than just five mice, but one for all of their villages. Um, they take no chances. They have been devastated, not just physically their bodies, but the grain fields have been devastated. And yet they have done what they were told to do, and they have seen that God has accepted uh, their humility. And uh, I wish the story ended right here, verse 18. Unfortunately, it does not. Verse 19. He struck down some of the men of Beth Shemesh because they had looked into the ark of the Lord. He struck down of all the people, 50,070 men, and the people mourned because the Lord had struck the people with a great slaughter. There is no justification for the actions of these men. This is a priestly city. There are Levites in, in Beth Shemesh. They know what God has prescribed concerning the ark. And so for them to do what is described here in the passage is to be in willful violation of what the law says. We could argue, I suppose, that by this time, because of the, the lack of integrity and devotion, and we've already established that there is something of a corrupt priesthood during this closing period of the, the period of the judges, that, that maybe they had become so lax and so ignorant in the ways of God and, and his people that they did so without thinking about it. But nonetheless, they have the oracles of God, and they should have known better if, in fact, they didn't know better. The alarmingly large number of people that are mentioned in the verse uh, has caused people to scratch their heads for, I suppose, as long as we've been reading from the English version uh, about this account. Uh, in the in the original language of the Hebrew, uh, the arrangement of the numbers is, is unlike any other uh, numbering system that you'll see in the Hebrew language. First, the number 70 is given. And then following that is the Hebrew word that designates 50,000. And that wording sequence is unique. It's found only here. Uh, it doesn't seem necessary, or doesn't seem likely, I should say, that there would be that many men living in Beth Shemesh. When you consider that, that uh, there were 34,000 uh, soldiers that were killed in all of Israel seven months earlier uh, when the ark was captured, it, it sort of boggles the mind that there would be in this one border town that many people. For that reason, a lot of scholars have theorized that 70 is the number that probably was intended there and that perhaps through a scribal error, uh, the 50,000 came in. But you'll find that uh, pretty much in every English Bible that you look at. You may also, however, find in your Bible some marginal notes that questions that number and suggest perhaps maybe 70 is uh, a more accurate number. In any case, this is unquestionably a terrible tragedy and an unnecessary tragedy that has occurred in a city that belongs to the priest. Verse 20, The men of Beth Shemesh said, Who is able to stand before the Lord, this holy God? And to whom shall he go up from us? So they sent messengers to the inhabitants of kiriath Jerem, saying, The Philistines have brought the ark of the Lord. Come down and take it up to you. So as I put this map back up on the screen uh, one more time, uh, this shows us the journey the ark made from Shiloh to Ebenezer, where it was captured, and then seven months in the Philistine cities of Ashdod, then Gath, then Ekron, before finally being sent to Beth Shemesh, and then the men of Beth Shemesh having the men of kiriath Jerem come and take the ark and put it there. It will not make its final journey to Jerusalem for another 20 years. But we'll see that uh, a little later on in the history of uh, Samuel and David. Well, the chapter ends on a sad note. It ends that way because of a disregard for the holiness of God. And because of that disregard, Israelites lost their lives. 
Because of that disregard, joy turned to grief, and it was so unnecessary. kiriath Jerem is also a city that belongs to the tribe of Judah, and it's also a border town. It's located to the northeast of Beth Shemesh, and it's near that place where the boundaries of the tribes of Judah and Dan and Benjamin all come together. But unlike Beth Shemesh, kiriath Jerem is not a Levitical city. Why it was taken there, we're not told. It certainly puts a little more distance between the Ark of the Covenant and the Philistines, and maybe they were thinking that was a good thing. Uh, but I'm pretty sure from what we've looked at that the Philistines had no desire to make a second attempt to capture the Ark. So I'm not really sure why it goes there, but what is noteworthy is that it was not taken back to Shiloh. It's not returned to where the tabernacle is. And as we've already seen, Shiloh is abandoned by the Lord. Uh, we will see Nob in the future as being a city where the tabernacle was set up. Uh, but the ark is not going to depart from kiriath Jerem and go to Nob. It will go to Jerusalem. And that will happen when David eventually successfully brings it. Well, the story does not end there. The first two verses of the next chapter will show us a little more information, give us rather a little more information about the ark's rest for 20 years at kiriath Jerem. But that is where we're going to close our class for today. And when we take up our study again the next time, we'll see God dealing with the Philistines in a very powerful way through the prophet Samuel. We'll come to that word Ebenezer one more time and we'll come to understand what it means. Until then, keep your social distancing up, keep safe, keep studying. God bless.